How rich is your heart? Each day provides a new experience. Each day provides a new opportunity to better yourself. Each day I wake up in the morning setting a goal to at least learn one thing, one thing, before I go back to bed tonight. And so, by learning one thing, not only will it allow me to grow, but it will allow me to challenge myself. And so, for example, did you know that you cannot breathe and swallow at the same time? I'm sure most of you are going to try to breathe and swallow throughout my sermon, so you might as well get it out the way. But I want to start today's sermon with a couple of more interesting facts of did you know. Did you know that if you know where your next meal is coming from and you don't have to worry about getting clean water, having shelter over your head, or accessing medical care, you benefit from more than for more wealth than many other people throughout human history. Did you know if you have food in the refrigerator, clothes on your back, and a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the world. Did you know if you have money in the bank, in your wallet, and spare change in a dish somewhere at home, you are among the top 8% of the world's wealthy. Did you know that if you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you are blessed than the million who would not make it at the end of the week? Did you know that if you make more than 50000 a year, you are among the top 1% of earners on this planet? Did you know that the most of the population of the entire world in fact, 80% lives on less than $10 a day. You know, that means your coffee costs as much as many people spend in a whole day. More than a third of people on Earth live on less than $2 a day, while 1.2 billion live on less than $1.25. Did you know that if you can attend a church meeting without fear or harassment, arrest, torture, or death. You are blessed more than three billion people who face the, the fear of being prosecuted in this world. <clears throat> Did you know that children in rich countries only face one in 65% chance of dying by the age of five? But in extremely poor countries, there are chances are one and six. As I read today's passage from Luke, coinciding with these eye-opening statistics, I was challenged to redefine my understanding of what it meant to be wealthy, of what it means to be rich. You see, in our culture today, we have become so fixated on accumulating more on accumulating wealth, finding career success, and obtaining financial prosperity. You see that the more we have stored up, the more happier we may be. For myself, I am often facing the challenge of thinking that I simply do not enough, have enough. I have about five boots, and so I just need one more boot in order to be happy. Or whether that is trying to save a penny just so that I can buy me a Subway sandwich. You see, I'm challenged to always think that just one more won't hurt. You see, the reality is that the constant effort to earn more can make you lose perspective on the reality of the abundant blessings of actual wealth you have. You see that we are blessed in ways that surpass our own understanding. But today we are challenged that we must shift our way of thinking and redefine what it means to be wealthy. See, our scripture today provided by Luke, Luke is challenging us as faithful disciples to inherit more of God and less of me. That we must become rich in our faith rather than being distracted of the worldly entities 
that may take away our attention from God. Scripture today opens up just as Jesus is in the middle of encouraging his disciples to confess even when they are under duress. But there is a man who has interrupted him, someone in the crowd who cries out to Jesus to sort out a financial dispute between the siblings. You see, the father of the man had left the inheritance for his two sons jointly. But this man in particular's love for money superseded his love for his brother. But of course, Jesus is the top dog. Jesus is the, the teacher. Jesus is the one who has the final say. So he cries out to Jesus and wants him to override what, how he should, what he should inherit. And so rather than sorting out this family dispute, <coughs> Jesus is moved to use this interaction as a teaching lesson. How many of us, too, have this experience or this type of ordeals? When we are caught in situations, and rather than having Jesus give us a direct answer, he uses these experiences as a teaching moment. This is our teaching moment. In this parable, the man's issue is not about the money, or not about the amount he had inherited, but it was the fact that he was tempted to devote his life into storing and growing this wealth because of his own desires. Sadly, money has become a stumbling block, not only between these brothers, but a stumbling block in our world today. There are families across this country that continue to break up due to money issues or relationships disrupted over the lust of having more wealth. You see, it is not the money that is the root of the evil, but the lust of money that is evil. The problem is not that the man is wealthy, but that he has allowed his wealth to lose track of what really is important in his life. The foolish man who is described in this parable is not foolish because he is making a provision for his future, but he is foolish because he believes that his wealth, he can secure his wealth for his future. You see, the man has focused his eyes close up on possessions that he does not see anything else. The man was rich prior to the harvest, but the harvest simply increased his wealth. Most of us would love to be in this position of having more money and getting on top of a bonus check. You see, this man certainly, certainly seems happy. However, all that he has is money. He does not mention no family, no friends, or no sense of community. There is no inclination of using this wealth to help others but that he is rich in money and poor in everything else. The first hint of this problem lies in the man's use of the first person pronoun. If you were to look back at this parable and circle all the I's and my's, you get a sense of what the brother's self-absorption absorption was. You see, he used the word I six times and the word my five times. Nowhere in this parable does he mention that he hired hands to help him or the services of his community to help live his life. But what also stood out to me was that there was no reference of thanking God for his tremendous wealth. According to this man, everything cries out, me, 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 me alone. In verse 17, he even begins to talk about himself rather than finding reason for anyone else. He is so inwardly focused that he requires no counsel from any others and he doesn't even ask God for guidance. You see, some people, some wealthy people, are tempted to hoard money, invest in stocks, or make bonds to make sure that their wealth will continue to grow. That the wealthier they are, the more comfortable and happier their life will be. But I think that Jesus makes his primary point at the end of this parable. That he is calling out those who store up treasures 
for themselves, but that are not rich towards God. You see, the problem is not wealth, but it is selfishness. I'm sure many of you know who Bill Gates is. You know, just the second richest person in the world. He's the co-founder of Microsoft, right behind the Amazon owner. But he has a net worth of more than $90 billion. In 2010, Bill Gates and his wife Melinda, they started a giving pledge. The Gates couple have set a goal to give away all their money. You see, every year they donate $4 billion to developing countries that try to end child mortality, distribute vaccinations, and improve access to education. In an interview that was conducted with this couple, the Gates couple simply want to focus their work on giving away their money. When asked upon why they want to give away these billions of dollars, two simple answers that were brief and concise. This work provides a sense of purpose, and it was an enjoyable challenge. You see that giving away their wealth is meaningful work, and was a responsibility that they felt. Brothers and sisters, this week we have been given a challenge to think about our stewardship of our own resources, not just money, but the other areas in our life that we are blessed with. Where is Jesus in the midst of your own abundance? Our passage today emphasizes the importance of redefining our own understanding of what it means to be wealthy. To be rich in Christ is surely to be thankful to God for our blessings. To be rich in Christ means stewardship that returns God's portion to God. To be rich in Christ means that we must mean generosity towards the neighbor whom Jesus had charged us to love. When we can redefine our understanding of what it means to be wealthy, we can begin to experience true happiness and what it means to be rich. You see, whether that, whether that is being wealthy in peace, rich in love, or abundantly overflowed with compassion, God has provided us blessings far beyond our own understandings. We are called as disciples of Christ to inherit more of God and less of me. For just as the book, uh, the book of Matthew chapter 6 reminds us, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. If that doesn't make sense, brothers and sisters. I promise you, that you, would, you will hear the phrase from me and throughout your life. That you will never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. Amen. <laughs>